All right, welcome to a podcast called Think Your Way to an Epic Life. And today I'm super stoked because this man has like the most epic life you can imagine. And we're going to get to dive into it. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of him, you know of him, but you don't really know him. You don't know who he is. And he is a really good man. So we're going to get a chance to know David Royball a little bit better. Welcome, David. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm excited for today. Yes, me too. I just can't wait to get into the good stuff here. <laughs> so David, tell me a little bit about how you started in life. Where, where, where were you born? What was life like for you as child. Okay. So, uh, I was actually, uh, born in, uh, well, I was born in Santa Fe. So I'm from up North and, uh, I grew up as a young kid in Espanola. Okay. So, um, I was, uh, I was born in Santa Fe, grew up in Espanola. And then in about sixth grade, I moved back to Santa Fe. And so, uh, stayed in Santa Fe for most of my, um, kid life, teenage life, and then uh, moved to Arizona for a little while and then moved to Albuquerque. Okay. Yeah. So so people who knew you as a kid, would they ever believe who you are today? <laughs> to be honest with you, I grew up very different than my life is right now, which is good, which has actually helped me quite a bit. Uh, I grew up uh, low income housing. I lived like in the projects my whole kid life, right? And so uh, I've seen both sides of, of, um, of the totem pole, I guess, right? So the reality is, is that I could have veered off uh, very easily and gone a very different direction. Um, but I was very lucky and I was very blessed to meet um, people outside of my neighborhood that I saw a very different life, right? I saw um, a very different type of family structure set up, things like that. I had very loving parents, don't get me wrong, right? But they didn't, they couldn't give me everything that I wanted. So at a very early age, I had to get a job and figure it out. And, you know, if I wanted a car, I was going to have to get a job to buy a car, right? If I wanted things, I was going to have to earn them. That is really cool. So so I'm going totally off track here for just bear with me because I heard you just the other day in a meeting. Yeah. You were talking about your Porsche. Yeah. And you were talking about I waited, I had a goal and I waited until I hit that goal to get that Porsche. Right. Could you have gotten that Porsche as soon as you wanted it? Sure. Why didn't you? Because I gauge things off of success, right? So I try to teach myself if I want something, then I have to earn it. Right. So I implement that into my team. I implement that into my kids, but I implement that into my life. Right. So if I want something before I had kids and before I had a team and before I had all of this, it was a game to me. And, um, you know, at 20, I started real estate at 22 years old. Yeah. Wow. I wish I had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, uh, at, at, by the time I was 25 years old, I was already, you know, making $500,000 a year. I was already um, selling quite a bit of homes. And so I was building a business, but I was always gauging things off of how many homes do I need to sell, right? Mm -hmm. Want to get a new Escalade. Okay, what does the Escalade cost? At the time, I think brand new Escalade truck was like seventy five or 80000 right? very expensive car at 25 years old. I wanted to get that. Cool. How many houses do I need to sell? Cool. How many things do I need to do in order to get that? Right. So I've always gauged that. And so I've kept that same kind of mindset and mentality, even into what I'm doing right now. Um, and the Porsche, I wanted the Porsche, I wanted an electric car, right? When all of these electric cars came out, I wanted to get one, but I wanted to get something better than a Tesla because I didn't think the Tesla was like sexy enough, right? But I didn't want to buy a car that was the first year either. So I started looking at the Tesla, I'm sorry, the Porsche, but I didn't want to buy first year electric Porsche. So I said, okay, if I hit this goal, then I'll get it. And so I hit the goal, I got it. And so that's kind of how I gauge things even to, to even today, I still do that quite a bit. So if I want something, I'll gauge it. It was funny, Delilah and I have been talking about um, her office furniture. You know that. Her office was your office. <laughs> yes. And Delilah wants this crazy desk, right? And I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. We can get the desk, but you got to sell two houses, right? 
And she's like, but I want it now. It's going to take some time to get in here. I said, well, you got to sell two houses and then you can get it. But last night we were talking. She said, guess what? I got two listings and I got a sale. And I'm about to sell this other one. So that means I get my desk, right? <laughs> so I'm keeping that mindset in her head so that she understands how I operate. Uh, her and I just got engaged. Yay. Thank you. And so she she's um, she's she already knows who I am as a person, but she's understanding my philosophy and my model, right? We implement that into the kids. Um, Maddox, who is her son, she, she, he just saw uh, um, Jeremiah earn um, some Oakleys, right? And so he asked me, he said, hey, can we get onto the Oakley website? I want to see what the Oakleys are that I would want. We found out the one that he wanted and we told him how much it was. It was $80, right? And so Delilah says, print out the um, picture of the Oakleys and bring it to the house. Now we have that in his room and now he's earning money to get to 80 bucks so he could buy his own Oakleys. That is such a huge <laughs> gift, David. I mean, no one taught that to you, did right. they? No, not at all. So what, what? how do you feel your life would have been different if they had taught you that at the beginning? I don't know. You know, my, my parents, uh, bless their hearts, they did the best that they can do for me, right? Mm -hmm. I was very competitive as a kid. I played sports quite a bit, right? So if I made the All-Stars, if I made the team, I got the new glove, I got the bat, I got the tennis shoes. So my parents would reward me that way, right? Right. And I stay very competitive even till now because of how I was as a kid in sports. Um, but no one ever really taught me that. So I really feel like, you know, uh, being part of uh, real estate and being uh, with Mike Carter, he was pretty much my mentor at Coldwell for uh, a really long time. They took me under their wing very early on. They realized that they had their little golden boy. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to show me the right way. And so from a very uh, early start in my career, they were always telling me, hey, you need to make sure you're never late on your taxes. You need to make sure you have plenty of money for your taxes. You need to make sure that you're buying houses. You need to make sure that you're parking cash. And so they got me set up the right way. And so I'm trying to do that now for my team, right? I'm trying to show these guys and these girls inside my organization the uh, model about money because that is not being taught in school. And it's very hard if you don't know and you're making a bunch of money how to cut your money up and how to invest your money and how to chop it up the right way. So I'm trying to teach these guys how to do it. David, you teach everybody. You're, you, that is one of the <clears throat> things, that is one of the cool things about being here at KW is it doesn't matter who it is. Somebody's walking down the hall and they say, hey, can you tell me something? Can you teach me something? I've never seen you not, like, no, uh-uh, I don't right. have time. Why are you like that? Well, I don't walk around acting like I'm this cool guy. And that's really important, right? When I was 25 years old, did I think I was a hot shot kid? Probably. For a little, sure. for a couple of years, I probably thought that I was this uh, person who was, killing it you know well, when you i was, were killing it i was killing it right but i also realized as i got a lot more successful i handled a lot of uh, power people in town mostly guys and the way that they would treat me and the way that they would act and the way that they would do business i wanted to be completely opposite of that because i didn't like the way that it made me feel right, right. there's always going to be somebody better there really is Right. Uh, even in sports today, you look at uh, all these athletes, you look at LeBron James, who's been the best. He's at the top of his game still, uh, however many years he's been doing it. But there's going to be somebody else that comes up that's better. So I've had all the pats on the back. I've had all the awards, all the trophies, all that stuff. And I feel so thankful and blessed um, to have that. But I don't walk around like I'm different than anybody else. And I think that's why, especially these last couple of years, we've been able to be very successful in the business, especially with other brokers, because I have a relationship with everybody and I keep I keep it cool with everybody. Are there some people that I don't like in town? Yes. And there's some people who've done me dirty in town. Yes. Right. But for the most part, I'm cool with everybody because I treat everybody the way that I want to be treated. There you go. Goes yeah. right back to the golden rule. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your real estate 
it's amazing the the, the <clears throat> trajectory that you're on. I want to talk about that too. Like, sure. where do you see yourself in the future? But but where? How did you get from a 25 year old hotshot that was making 500 grand a year to the David Roy Ball that we all know and love today? Yeah. Well, you know, for me, I was never really wanting to have a team. So for many years, so for 14 years of my career, I was an individual agent. Okay. So I was listing agent, buyer's agent, marketing person. I had always had assistants and I've always um, ran a few people, but never really ran like a team. Mm -hmm. And so one year I had this goal, you know how it is, like you get in real estate, you're like, okay, I want to make hundred grand. Right. right. Got to get to 100. Got to get to 100. And then it's like, well, I want to get to 250. And then you say, I think I can get to 500. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have this vision of a million dollars. I want to get to seven figures. And the last year that I was basically an individual agent on my own, I sold. I was I was always hovering very close to 100 transactions um, by myself. The last year I got to like. I think it was 98 transactions, worked my butt off. Oh, you had to be exhausted. You know, high, high six figures, but I didn't get to that million, right? And I just realized that I needed to have, I couldn't physically be at the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's why I started my team. And I know a lot of people are going to watch this, and I know a lot of people are thinking team, and I know a lot of people right now uh, um, think that running a team is like the cool new thing to do, but it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult. Um, I've had a big ego check in the last three years, four years, because I've always been the guy to go get it. I've always been the guy to sell Honored homes. I've always been the guy to battle for the listing, to uh, win the transaction. And now I've taken more of a leadership role. And that's where I've seen the change. I am really focused right now on the leadership aspect of my life, my organization. And through that, it's created multiple seven figure income now, right? not just getting to that 1 million mark. COVID was really interesting for us because I was very scared through COVID what was gonna happen because I was building out my team. Mm -hmm. So I feel like through COVID, the real leaders of any kind of organization stepped up. Every single day, I had a Zoom meeting for months, every single day. I was checking on my people, we had game plans, we were doing this, we were doing that. Well, through COVID, I had the biggest year that I ever had in my career, right? We smoked through uh, seven figures, right? Um, through the hardest and most challenging time because I was very nervous and scared, right? I'm the type of leader that will burn the boats. I am a, a, a leader, I'm not a boss. What I mean by that is that I lead by example. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not just dictating. Am I the master delegator? Absolutely. I've figured out that role. Right. right? But I am also very good at leading by example and doing the things that we're supposed to be doing in order for the process to go smoothly. Right. And, and I feel like that's the separator is making sure that someone understands the process, whether it's a client, that's what separates a good agent from a great agent or a bad agent, right? Or a good leader from a great leader or a bad leader is that process. If somebody on your team doesn't understand that process, then they're not gonna know what to do, what uh, to say, and how to get that deal to the closing table. Same thing on, on the transaction side, right? If you get somebody to like you and trust you, it's on. But if you can't get them to make sure that they understand the process of what next steps are gonna be, then you're not gonna get the referral. You're not gonna get the uh, review. You're not gonna get uh, your phone to continue to keep ringing off of that one transaction. And that's what I'm super focused on is making sure that the customer experience is very high so that we can continue to get referrals. Because a lot of our team's business, which is really cool, we're not the type of team that's spending thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month on leads. We're not. I'm teaching my people how to fish. I'm teaching my people how to go out and get it so that if um, you uh, uh, decide to not be on my team anymore, you know what you're doing. 
Joseph Gonzalez, great friend of mine, he just jumped off my team, right? And when we had our uh, meeting, this was a couple weeks ago, um, he said, I'm ready. I said, you are ready. Yes. I've taught you how to run a file. I've taught you how to have an assistant. I've taught you how to do all of the things that you need to do in order to win, right? And so in a weird way, I'm not the type of person that gets really mad. I've seen a lot of people in town uh, burn bridges with a lot of their uh, agents who become mega talent. There's some big, big talented players who were on teams before. Um, I'm not that type of person, right? I'm almost like proud papa. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Get it, baby. Right. Go after it. Go get it. Go do it. And I'm always constantly building my bench anyway. For me, I'm very blessed because if I want to uh, hire 10 people, I can get on Facebook and do a live or I can do a video and say, guys, I'm opening up some spots mm -hmm. and boom, I can get people because a lot of people already come to me about real estate, but I'm really selective on who gets to play with me, you know? <clears throat> so why is it, why is it important or is it important for someone who's new in their business to get on a team? Well, I think the model of a team right now is like the old brokerage model, right? Yeah, exactly. Like an old, you know, Coldwell Banker. That's the only other experience that I have, right? So, you know, it's a it's a it's a turnkey setup. When you go over to Coldwell Banker, right? Mm -hmm. They have a training program. They have onboarding. They have somebody putting up your signs. They have somebody making a flyer for you. They they don't provide the lead, right? but they tried to teach you all of those things. Well, if you jump on a team who is running it properly like a team, you got proper onboarding, you have a transaction coordinator, you have a productivity coach, somebody's gonna take you from start to finish. You have somebody who's gonna help you on the back end, on the transaction side. You have somebody who's mentoring you, guiding you, teaching you how to win. So if I was a new agent, right? That's what I would do. And, and that's what I did. I was actually on a team when I first started. So this was before teams were even a thing is I knew how I learned. I learned through you showing me versus reading a book. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody said, hey, yeah, you're going to be on my team and this is our like onboarding pamphlet mm -hmm. or booklet that you need to read. I would not be a good fit for that team. Right. Right. I would, I would want to go on an appointment, show me how to do it, let me watch you, let me learn. That's how most people are, um, learn, right? But that's how I learn. And so that's kind of how I try to teach my people mm -hmm. is I would try to get people to do the things that I'm doing so that they understand the process of how to do it when it's their opportunity. Whew. <clears throat> okay, so real estate, equal opportunity for anyone? I don't know. I don't know if it's for for anyone, right? The cool thing about real estate is sky is the limit. The cool thing about what we do is that we don't have a ceiling as to what somebody uh, tells us we can earn or how much time, energy, and effort we put into something, right? Right. So that's the cool thing about it, right? But on the other hand, it's not for everybody. Because like you watch TV and you watch all these shows, it's not. It, you're dealing with people's feelings. It's crazy out there right now. You're dealing with their emotions. <clears throat> and that's even crazier than feelings because they're making you know decisions based off of how they're feeling currently. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with their money. And you have to be able to... Uh, be confident enough in your ability to be able to make that happen and check all those boxes and at the end of the day make them feel like their money is safe because most people will only buy a home right like 99 percent of people i think are their biggest investment is a home mm -hmm. you know you got the one percent who are buying other things um but the reality is is that most people are working that's the american dream right yeah. to own a home to be able to take my hat off pop my shoes off at uh, night knowing that this is like mine and i own it and i've worked hard for it and so that's there's a fine line that you have to be able to, you know, deal with people in order for that to happen. So, you know, I don't know that real estate's for everybody. It's not fun, right? It could be fun, 
but it's not fun because it's a grind. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are going to probably watch this, you know, like it is a grind. I have been grinding so hard. People say, oh, you know, it's not about work, 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 work. Well, that is like a big part of it. <laughs> well, yeah. So what would you say to the people who might be listening to this that are, are, are really, truly, this is really their heart when they hear you are going to say, you're just lucky. Yeah. What would you say to them? given the opportunity. Yeah, you know, it's it's not luck because, <laughs> you know, I could have, again, went a very different direction in my life, right? People who really know me as a young person uh, know how hard uh, I've tried to make this happen, you know? And I was one of the first young guys in town to really make it in town. And so that was even harder because I was very, I have a baby face, like, <laughs> I've earned all these, uh, you know, <laughs> my hair uh, turning, you know, gray and stuff like that now. But I was very young. And so I had to be very knowledgeable up front so that somebody would give me that opportunity. But once I opened up my mouth, I needed to know what I was talking about for them to be confident enough in me actually handling it, right? Because I was a very likable person, but I wanted them to like me and trust me first. But then I needed them to give me that opportunity. And I had a lot of no's and I had a lot of losses uh, in my career, right? Even to this day, I'm not winning every single opportunity, right? Right. And I'm still out there and I'm still battling and, you know, people on my team, my team are still losing. But you have to be able to feel that in order to grow, right? How much failure... A successful person has how much failure? More than 50%. Honestly. I've lost more than I've won. Promise. Mm -hmm. Right? But all those losses... So how do you get back up? Just keep going. I don't have a choice. For a really long time, and this is my this has always been my mindset, for a really long time, my back has always been up against the wall. Right? I liked that pressure for years. That pressure now isn't there as much because I have people inside my organization who are carrying and lifting the heavy load, right? Mm -hmm. But for a really long time, I have always had my back up against the wall and I like it. You know, I've taken care of my parents, right? I bought my mom a home. I bought my dad a home. I bought my dad a new car. I bought, I've taken care of my family. That's what makes wait, wait, me wait, feel wait. good. How does that? How does that feel? To get, you can't just say that and just go on because I bet you ninety percent of the people, probably ninety nine percent of the people watching this, <clears> have not had the ability to buy their parents a home, let alone two homes and a car. Right. What, what, what does that do for your heart? That is the best feeling in the world if you can do that. Right. That beats any vacation. That beats anything. Taking care of your family, especially for me, like my parents, I'm very blessed because I still have both my parents. Um, but that is like, I love that. I always, if you are around me or if you hang out with me, like I just always take care of people. That is my like love language. Right. You know, you know this from experience with Absolutely. your assistant. Oh my gosh. Right? Yes. You know this from experience, but mm -hmm. that's just the type of person that I am. Because you know what? <clears throat> it got done for me by somebody, right? And so my team, all the guys on my team, there's a few people that, that say, you know, like, let, let me take care of it. Let me get it this time. I said, you know what? You're going to be the guy. You got to do it for the next person, right? When my 18-year-old kid gets into real estate and you're the hot shot dude, and, you know, you're taking them to lunch, you're taking them to coffee, you buy them a suit, you do all the things that I'm doing for you to make you feel good and confident, you know, you pass it down, pass it down to the next one, right? Now, nobody said, hey, you got to buy your mom and dad a home, right? right? But my mom and dad would have never been able to buy a home. They would have never been able to do it. So I did it for them so that they know that they have a place to call home for as long as they want. Wow, I, I, that is so awesome. I, I heard you once tell a story. I, think, I don't know who asked you the question, but you told a story about what was the most fun thing that you ever did because of your wealth that gave you the opportunity to do it, and it was take your mom to Vegas. Oh, yeah. Tell me about that. Oh, that was so cool. So last year, my mom, bless her heart, she worked at the deli at Smith's like for 30 years, wow. right? 
hardest working person out there, right? Um, and she had never been to Vegas before, ever. She was 69 years old. Last year was her 69th birthday. And I said, hey, grab your sister, grab your favorite sister, and we're going to go to Vegas, and we're <laughs> going to spend the weekend in Vegas, right? So it was Delilah and I, my mom, and my aunt. <clears throat> and we had a ball, right? <laughs> she had, you know, beautiful room at the Wynn. We did shows. We did dinners. We went out. I took her to Bruno Mars. We went to a concert. Like, we just did it up. We I think I blew like 10 grand in like three days <laughs> on my cool. mom. It was so fun, right? But I created a memory <laughs> for my mom. I really created a memory for me. I'll right. never, ever forget that, right? right? But I created a memory for my mom because she had never been able to do that, and she did it up. You know what I mean? And she had a blast with her sister and with Delilah, and she was able to experience it. My mom is you know she she i can call my mom right now i can call my dad right now say hey can you help me out at the house can you go mow the lawn real quick on a listing that they didn't do or can you go and clean the house right now they would do it in one second they would do it for me right but they would do it for me regardless if i would have bought them a home or not that's just what what they do for me you know and so that's what they've taught me to do for others but it's a very, very cool feeling to be able to do that more than anything that I own, more than anything that I have. For me to be able to create those types of experiences for my family is really important to me. When you do it for so many people, yeah, you know, you, it, it's just it's just amazing getting to the opportunity to be around you and and what, everything that he's telling you guys. It is absolutely true. Absolutely. It, it's you, it's almost like you are watching and making sure everybody's okay. And if they're not, you're on it. Like, make sure that gets taken care of. Let's let's handle it. It's that. just really interesting. Like, I just, I like that feeling. You know, I like being that person. And I feel like I could be that person, right? I don't wake up every single day and say, ooh, I'm going to like make $10,000 today. I never think about the money. I promise. I don't wake up every day. Uh, wear a suit and think about the money and that's the difference because I don't put that first and I try to teach my team that when somebody tries to ask us to do a sweetheart deal or do this or do that there's all these people who are looking for leverage to try to make an extra dollar we would never risk that ever for money right I would never do that to risk that in order for me to build a uh, to burn a, a relationship right right and so that's important because there's a lot of people that think oh well these people are doing really good they must be shady to get ahead or do things like that right and that's not how i operate so david what we need something that's applicable to people that they can start to use right away sure what do you do every day what's your morning routine so i think that like if i had to say one thing right Get yourself into the mindset of affirmations. Affirmations are really important because it's making you believe something, right? For years, I've been doing this probably 10 years every day, right? I um, write affirmations down, and then the night before, I write down what I need to do the next day, okay? So that I have something to work off. Because you can easily come to the office, grab some coffee, make the rounds, say what's up to everybody, right? Jump in your office, make a couple calls, it's lunch, go get food, go hang out. Before you know it, you're at happy hour. Before you know it, it's eight o'clock at night. And you've spent a hundred bucks and you didn't do anything to generate opportunities right yeah so affirmations for me a it keeps me grounded and it gives me an opportunity to know what i'm focused on uh, b it keeps me in the right mindset for what the task is ahead so i make sure that my team and myself understand so for like the affirmation that i've been writing right i enjoy selling two homes per week i enjoy selling two homes per week i enjoy selling two homes per week Right. So you get one affirmation and you write it how many times? Well, uh, all month. So every, like, every single, I you fill up the one, whole page, Okay. right? And I write it every day for 30 days. And then after 30 days, we'll switch it up. Okay, now that's applicable, guys. If you, 
do it and just see what happens. Yeah. Well, you gotta you gotta get yourself into you know. Do I want to be the best dad? Do I want to be the best person? Do I want to make it to the gym every day? Whatever your goal is, it doesn't have to be business, mm-hmm. right? For me, it's business because everything outside of like you know going to the gym. That's I'm pretty disciplined at that. You know, eating right, drinking a certain amount of water, going on my walk, doing all the things that I've just built that into my brain. But making sure that I consistently hit my goal. If David Royball can run a team of people and still hit two a month, I'm sorry, two a week, then I'm at eight, then my team carries another 20, then we're at 28, right? That is a big life right? That is having a big vision. And sometimes I'll hit it and sometimes I won't. But if I can get six, cool. If I can get five, cool. If I can get 10, cool. But my goal is eight. And I gauge that always. So if somebody needed something quick startup, I think affirmation is really, really important because it gets you into the right mindset. You know, it's funny, of all the self-development things that I did for years, that affirmations was the thing that I just wouldn't do, wouldn't do, wouldn't do. And then when I'm doing it, it's like, why would I not do that? That's It's the easiest thing in the world to do, and it's powerful. Right. So how how do you convince somebody that it's not Stuart Smiley in the mirror saying, I like me? Right. Well, I think that you just have to try it. Try it and see what happens, Right. Why do you think that they make you at Bold make, what is it, 15 calls a day? 20. 20 contacts a day, right? If you really truly did 20 a day for 30 days, I promise you, you would have something going on. Mm -hmm. I promise you. Yep. Right? If you did affirmations every day for a month and you taught yourself and you trained yourself and you trained your brain to want to do something and have a goal, it would happen. Because it works for me all the time. I promise, I've had notebooks and notebooks and notebooks. I know you had Ashley on um, before and she probably, what did she say? Does she say affirmations? Absolutely. Right, because Absolutely. we're like ninja, old school, Coldwell Banker, they like pounded that in our head and we and we went to the classes to do that. But they, um, they taught us that and we've, We've done that ever since, so it works. I promise. Oh yes, it, it absolutely. I promise too. It absolutely does. From somebody who is just no way, I'm not doing that for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so somebody wants to go from let's say that they're doing seven million a year, right? Um, and they're getting overwhelmed by it. What's their next step? Well, really, truly, you need to make sure that you have the right admin team in place. I have always had admin team in place and a good assistant, I mean, for me, somebody who was, you know, pounding at a high level, you can easily get to 70, 80 with one person, easy. If you have that right one person, if you, I'm talking about 70 or 80 units, right? Homes in one year, right? Once, once you hit 70 or 80 homes, you have to have some other people. You have to. Because then you're going to get burnt out, right? I um, got divorced and I had a three-year-old and a a one-and-a-half-year-old baby. And I was this crazy realtor. And I went from always being able to meet you at any time to having to a single dad with two babies. And so I had to get very good at time, you know. I never really lived off of a calendar or a schedule, and now my whole world revolves around that, right? So you got to make sure that you're disciplined enough for you to be able to put those in your schedule, make sure that you have the right mindset in order for you to make that happen, but you have to have a right admin first. And really, truly, you can utilize a showing agent to offset your time, but the next hire has to be another admin. You need two solid admin, one on the listing side, one on the transaction side. And if you're the only person doing sales, you can easily hover at 70 or 80 if you have two admin on your team. Okay. So I would say two admin first, yourself, and then showing agent. Don't get a buyer's agent first. Get a showing agent. Have overflow. Teach somebody how you like them to show the house for you. 
see if you like having a showing agent before you take somebody on and bring them on your team. Okay. Um, where, <clears throat> what do you do with your money? What, how do you grow your money that you're making? I've always been a very big investor in real estate because that's what I know, right? So there's a lot of different models out there. There's a lot of people that say, oh, well, I have 80 doors. I have 100 doors, and that's amazing, and that's great. But nothing is paid off, and they're getting good cash flow. But if something happens, they're really maxed out, yeah. right? They're mm -hmm. really maxed out. Uh, for me, my mindset has always been buy five homes, pay five off. Buy five homes, pay five off. So I have 15 homes, 15 rentals. Well, I have 14 rentals in my personal home, right? Okay. And so of the 14 rentals and my personal home, I have 10 homes free and clear. Sweet. Right? So it's different because I'm sitting on probably four four and a half million dollars of equity, which I have lines opened on. If anything comes up sure. and I need it, I can take advantage of it. But my goal has always been, okay, I need to get to $5,000 a month cash flow. And I need to get to $10,000 a month cash flow. Now I'm sitting at $25,000 a month cash flow, <laughs> right, yes, on the rentals. But I'm sitting on almost $5 million free and clear. So if my mouth breaks, right? Sure. Everything plus my personal residence has been paid off for years, you know. So I'm sitting on a million dollar uh, home in Tanawan, free and clear, right? Mm -hmm. But I have an opportunity to go out and buy stuff. So you know, if you're trying to be an investor, don't get so caught up in the doors because the doors means nothing. It's ego. It's, it's cash e flow. Yeah. You know. I am driving around in a $150,000 car. I'm not paying for it. Yeah. Somebody is. My kids go to private school. I'm not paying for it. Somebody is, right? right? So that's how I gauge success too on the investment side. It's not that you're just parking a bunch of money in real estate and hoping and praying or have a bunch of money in the stock market. It's, is your money working for you? And you gotta play the long game in rentals. I've, I've been buying real estate for 18 years. Now I'm reaping the benefits of it. Now, 21 years later with 25K in cash flow, right? Yeah. And all of this stuff paid off. So if, as I've had big years in real estate, I've paid things off. There are some people that say, oh, that's dumb. Don't pay off the houses. Don't do this. Don't do that. Well, I promise you, I've never missed making a payment on one of these things, yeah. right? It, 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 I, I've never sat back and said, oh, I miss paying that rental, making a payment on that rental, <laughs> right? It's like, ooh, here comes 2,500, here comes 2,200, here comes 1,900. Yeah. That's basically paying for everything else that I'm um, buying and owning and, and have now. So it's how you set it up. So don't get caught up on the doors, I promise. Right. And I've heard so many people that do. It's just, it's almost like I it's got an ego it, thing. It's ego. I got, well, I've got this building on this street and, uh, and it's like, the building I got 80 not. doors. I got a hundred <laughs> doors. Well, cool. Uh huh. Yeah. How, do, how was that through COVID when no one was paying you? Oh, gosh. on, on your uh, apartment complex. Mm hmm. And right. There's nothing you could do. You couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Them you out. Can't kick them no. out. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, COVID uh -huh. was a big test because I think that it showed a lot of people what they can get away with. Right. Mm -hmm. But it also showed people. I know a lot of millionaires on paper. When something happens, can you survive? Can you eat that? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the difference when you have a free and clear asset versus something that's financed and nobody's making the payment. So it's not, almost like you're a hybrid with Dave Ramsey and other people. Right. Because Dave is like, I know. think he's an idiot. <laughs> But, but it is this, you know, you've got it paid off. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, it's, his, it's different. Like he, he's like, oh, don't go buy don't a house. Don't use other people's money. money. Like, yeah. I don't think that's dumb. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm saying get them free and clear, but make sure you still have some money in the bank. Right. But keep the lines open if you need something. Could I go out and pull a bunch of money on these rentals? Here's the other beautiful thing about free and clear. Right. If there's a $2 million apartment complex that I want. 
and I could take 100, 100, 100, 100, 100 out of all these free and clear. The beautiful thing about having it free and clear is that 100 that I just borrowed, the tenant's paying it back, not me. And then I'm buying the $2 million apartment and then that thing's cash flowing. I'm not the type of person that's just buying to buy though. I'm very selective on what I buy and I can stay patient and I'm not afraid to sit on some cash if I need to. You know, a lot of people say, make your money work for you. Yes, that's fine, but make sure you have some cash readily available because if things continue to shift in the next couple years, the person who has the cash, it's on. That's right. Because then we're going to be able to really um, buy things at a discount. Because financing is financing, right? I don't care about the rate as long as I'm making money on my money. But if there's an opportunity that you can take advantage of and they only want cash and quick close and you have a couple hundred, that's where you make a lot more money. Okay, so do me a favor and look in the camera and talk to buyers. Why should they not care? It, let's just say this is a home. They're not an investor. They're not, but but they are living in an apartment. Right. Why should they still buy? Well, you have the benefits of a write-off. That's step one, right? And here's the cool thing about an interest rate. It fluctuates all the time. So you don't necessarily have to be married to that rate, right? You could date the rate for a little while. But at the end of the day, it's your home. And so if you wait and the rates go up, and even if the price goes down, you're still paying more in interest over time, right? Mm -hmm. If you wait, and this is what we're seeing now, and the rate goes up, which we've been seeing, but the prices continue to go up, then you're really hurting yourself because now you have out, you, you basically, the market's outpriced you for your affordability because we live in Albuquerque, right? So many people are driven by payment. Yeah. So you got to be sensitive to the payment. Well, payment is driven by rate. And if the rate continues to go up, then you won't be able to get the payment that you want, which will then make you stay in the apartment. Which that rate's going to continue to go up. Oh, I like, I'm, I'm loving this right now <laughs> as an investor. <laughs> sure. Because I am just raising my rent and I'm getting 30 applications. I just had one that I just put on the market Friday and um, it's 1,700 square feet and it's on of uh, Malaguena, which is on the other side of Tanawan East uh, in the Academy Ridge area. And it's a fantastic home and it's 2,500 a month. And I have like eight applications right now at 2,500 a month. When I had a mortgage, which was years ago, the payment on that house, which I paid 210, was like 1200 and like 20 bucks, and I'm getting 2500. So even if I had a mortgage on that house right now today, I'd still be cash flowing more than $1000, which is crazy. Yeah. So the so the rent is still very high right now. So if you had to buy and you were going to live here and stay here for a while, you know, don't rent, buy. Absolutely. Okay. Well, David, do you have any last words for of wisdom for people who are just enthralled by your story? You started off in the projects and now you're able to buy your parents' homes, take them on wonderful vacations. You're getting married to the yes. love of your life. Yes. How did you convince her to say yes? I don't know. <laughs> Man, she's... Nah, she's a sweetheart. Yeah. And we've been through a lot together um, in terms of, uh, like, she's seen me grow so much. She understands my world. She, she knows that, you know, my life is big. And I've seen her grow so much. She has turned into, like, a completely different person from when I met her. Um, she's always had it in her. And I think that now she has somebody who is, like, getting it out of her. And she is just doing so well. But I, I would say the last thing I would tell anybody, right, is just take care of people. I am in the people business. I just happen to sell houses, but I am in the people business. And if you take care of people and you make sure that you put them first, it's on. And that's in any sales job. That's in any job, really. Right. Right. But in real estate, if you just focus on the customer, I promise everybody says that, but so many people get caught up in the money, 
So many people get caught up in the feelings and the emotions of the transaction. If you just take care of people, right? I see Delilah right now. Um, she is like above and beyond on all of her clients. And it's so wild because she just gets so much business out of them. And I was, and I'm still like that. And I was, I was once like her. My operation is very different now where I have a lot of people touching my clients, not just me. But I see a lot of me early on in Delilah now, and she just takes care of people. And it's so crazy that if you just do that, the amount of opportunities that come your way. It's, it's all about relationships, isn't it? Yeah. So, so I, mean, I know that was supposed to be the last thing, but how important have relationships been in your ascent to where you are now? Well, they're, they're very important because with the brokerage that I'm at right now, with the agents uh, right now in the business, right? For the last two years, there's been 10, 10, 10, 20 offers on homes. Some homes had 20 offers, right? Because I have a relationship with the other agent, I promise you, and everybody watching this knows that that's how these transactions were going down, is if I had a relationship with somebody and they knew that we ran a tight ship and we were fair, we had a very good chance of being able to get it, especially because most people were disclosing now, right? Mm -hmm. So they were also trying to guide us to the best of their ability to make it happen for us. So relationships are very, very important. And it can go the other way too. Don't be mean and ugly because the pendulum is already swinging back. <laughs> and you remember all those people who weren't very cool to you. Absolutely. Yeah. You've got, you treat people the way you want to be treated. I, and the platinum rolls may be even a little better, right? Yeah. You treat, find it because they might not want to be treated like you do. Find out what the, how they want to be treated and sure. treat them that way. So David sure. Roy Ball, man, thank you. I You're love welcome. you, brother. Thank appreciate you for being it. here. Thank you. Thank you guys. I appreciate it guys. Thanks so much.